Hello and greetings from the UK. Thank you for inviting me to contribute to this important SICA Career Development Summit with the four key themes of sustainability, scalability, standards and support. In normal times, I would be with you in Australia on a shared journey of exchanging ideas and us learning from one another, maybe over a cup of coffee or perhaps in a nice restaurant. But of course, these are not normal times. So in the 30 minutes I have, I'm going to make the case for investment in career development and hopefully uh, stimulate some thoughts and ideas. I'm here in Exeter in the southwest of England on a cold and wet day. So I hope you have sunnier climates than we have here. So let's begin by looking at life as we know it. I've been in lockdown for almost a year with some limited opportunities to spend time with my children and grandchildren. Masks, vaccines, hospitals, empty streets, shops and bars are the realities for now. But in the context of uh, this summit, I would like us to think about a story of two halves. So the first is on the right, represented by happiness that the COVID-19 pandemic will eventually go away. However, the consequences for individuals, for jobs and livelihoods in the UK, in Australia and across the globe will be felt for many years to come. So let's hold on to that image of the individual on the left and sort of think about how we can ensure that we can support many people as they build their lives in the aftermath of the pandemic. Now, I promise you that my presentation will be upbeat. And so I want to just say, first of all, whilst COVID has challenged all of us, congratulations, Australia. You have actually done extremely well as an idle island compared to the UK. For example, 28,900 COVID cases compared to 3.6 million UK cases with 117,000 deaths here in the UK. So well done, Australia. You actually closed your border at a time when we should have done so. So let's have a look at my presentation and the content. We're going to look at, very briefly, the burden of the pandemic, the importance of career guidance, you call it career development, evidence and impact. And in particular, I'm going to set a wicket question for you, which is where are the places and spaces where individuals can get really good career support, both online and offline? And perhaps in our audience, we may have someone uh, from Treasury who will be interested in that rich old chestnut of what's the return on investment. So I'm going to have a look at that as well. So let's begin by the burden uh, of the impact of the pandemic. You know and I know that job roles and labour markets are changing rapidly. Job security has come to an abrupt and cruelly diminished many opportunities for people without warning. The impact of job losses and lives upended by the pandemic have yet to be fully realised. People living in the poorest neighbourhoods are suffering more from unemployment and worsening mental health. We all know that. We also know that the burden of the crisis has fallen unevenly across economic sectors. While the impact of the recession has been less difficult for people like me and, and probably you if you can work from home. Workers employed in industries such as retail, construction, manufacturing, mining, tourism, to just name but a few in Australia, have been especially hard hit. Job security has been uh, an issue for many people working in the gig economy. I read recently about the uh, difficulties of the live music industry in Australia. And when we think of career development, of course, we have to think about the rise of non-standard employment. Furthermore, the pandemic exacerbated pre-existing trends in poverty and inequality, income inequality in particular, which was already in, uh, on the rise in many advanced um, economies. Uh, and also on the developing economies as well. The lowest paid have been badly affected, not least because forecasts before the pandemic were suggesting a sharp fall 
in demand for low skilled work. Over the next decade, we're going to see that actually uh, as a big issue around how can we upskill our, our human capital. Now, lockdowns and school closures have cast indeed a long shadow on millions of young people and their future prospects. But we know from academic studies that lower interrupted lifetime schooling is associated with lower lifetime income and earning trajectories. COVID-19 threatens to fully undo decades of progress and push millions, if not tens of thousands of people into job insecurity, which is why this conference and the timing of it is so important. Finding new solutions to provide what I call a career support safety net uh, for people most in need is essential. Ministers, policymakers, and service providers will indeed be under pressure uh, to find the most effective ways of using scarce resources. And this slide illustrates how, regardless of our role, we all have to find that sweet spot where we can maximize the resources that we have to really good effect. Now, David Blunstein in America, psychologist who studied uh, work and the psychology of work, reminds us of the need to pay attention to multiculturalism, to think about issues to do with class, race, uh, sexuality, health and disability as they play out in our society. And in the context of career development, practitioners have evidence that they can truly add value to this agenda. And uh, for example, in Wales, where I've recently been working, uh, the minister in Wales uh, has actually charged the careers professionals with looking at diagnosis and assessment of need of the most vulnerable people in Wales, both young and old. So I want to give you a few examples along the way of how practitioners have got that skill set that can be harnessed. And of course, growing pressure works for all of us. It forces us to come together and think up of new ideas. There is growing importance of career guidance, as we can see here from recent developments of international organizations and European bodies who've come together to look at the argument for investing in career guidance. So I'm not really going to replicate what's in this really important uh, report, but just to raise your awareness of it and to say that there will be other reports coming out over the next 12 months. And uh, one of the most important, I think, uh, findings for me when I read this and uh, a European literature review looking at lifelong guidance is this need to look at fresh policy impetus with greater emphasis on professionalism and quality assured provision. There is the argument that poor services for poor people are often delivered by poorly trained and qualified individuals. So this is a challenge for us to sort of think about how can we ensure that that professionalism and quality assurance is there at the heart of policies. Now, last year, there were concerns about automation taking people's jobs, and that hasn't gone away, part of that fourth industrial revolution. There is an urgent need for people of all ages to upskill and reskill as artificial intelligence and machine learning intensifies. A time for change in career development services is clearly on the horizon. To be sustainable, scalable and maintain standards requires new and existing blended ways of working to provide that safety net I talked about. And human, social and cultural oh. capital is vital. It's vital for the Australian economy, it's vital for individuals' lives and for families to thrive and do well. And there's bad news and there's good news. Uh, I promise to be upbeat, but I have to sort of remind myself and you won't need to be reminded that many people have lost their jobs. And for many people who have been in jobs, they're now thinking, maybe this has given me a chance to reflect and think about switching to a new job. Or maybe people are part of the long queue of 
waiting to get some sort of support to help lift them into really good quality uh, learning, training or employment. And one of the findings that uh, the uh, pandemic and research has shown us is that there are certain groups who've been adversely affected. Women, ethnic minorities, uh, disabled people, uh, and particularly um, people who are most vulnerable in our society, including minority ethnic uh, young people and adults. They often face greater um, barriers to moving into work and changing jobs. Older people are also likely to be particularly at, at risk. Uh, think of it yourself if you were displaced in your 50s, that sort of thinking about where can you go for support? If there is no support, you're likely to give up and actually uh, maybe not ever enter the labour market again. Huge wastage. Now, there is some good news in this, which is that across the world, young people are leaving education today and they're on average more highly qualified than any of the preceding uh, generation in history. They enter the jobs market with often considerably more years of schooling than their parents or their grandparents. But for many young people, it's difficult to get that exposure to and experience of the world of work. Today's young people are the most ambitious generation ever. You know, it's a tribute to the school system uh, in Australia uh, and around the world that actually young people have uh, these high ambitions because higher levels of education are associated with lower levels of adult unemployment. And good work really helps build better futures. Uh, maybe for your conference, you know, it's about how do we build those uh, better futures for young people and for adults. Addressing inequality is good for economics. There's a huge body of research on this, as well as furthering social uh, justice. So issues to do with decent work, inclusion, career support, places and spaces are really key uh, throughout the summit around sort of thinking about how to tackle these issues. And the diagram here shows that it's not just about equality of opportunity, it's about what sort of initiatives can be put in place that actually ensure equity. I was involved recently in a study um, in a major city in England, which actually showed that the schools were, uh, which were in the most affluent areas or had uh, the highest achieving results, were most likely to access government funding compared to those schools that were uh, in uh, more difficult and challenging areas. So we have to sort of reverse this trend of actually um, thinking about funding, which can go to places where actually um, perhaps that's not the best place that they, they should go. So this is a really uh, big, big challenge. And I think the language of inclusion and uh, inequality is shifting more towards an inclusive society where the well-being of individuals and our economy sit side um, by side. Now, why should we bother even worrying about the evidence base and the impact? And here's an example of uh, treasury buildings in London. Um, and we've got something called the Green Book, which guides all decisions around government investments. And I wanted to share this comment from the OECD, which said that, Unless we can demonstrate the link between education and wealth creation, education will remain a footnote in the discussion of finance ministers. And what we need to do for career development is ensure that it's not just a footnote for finance ministers. And your summit, I'm sure, will raise some interesting uh, points on this uh, particular topic. Now, the other key point I'd like to share is that the evidence base and career development internationally and indeed in Australia is rich in content. And there are various thematic areas of policy interest. And I'm going to pick up on some themes um, throughout my presentation. But what I really wanted to say was that 
the existing evidence base uh, has been anchored in psychology, um, in uh, social, social science, in education, in ethnography, in uh, philosophy, and indeed in economics. And uh, years ago, there were very few uh, studies on randomized control trials and quasi-experimental and experimental studies. But actually, we are seeing more and more of that. For example, a couple of years ago, um, there was uh, a thought that in career education, there were no randomized control trials or very few or uh, quasi-experimental studies. And I led a project which actually uh, showed that there are indeed many studies that we can draw upon, but in fact, what we do is we need many, many more. So I hope, um, depending on where you look at things, you might be somebody who wants to quantify something uh, in terms of the hard numbers and the figures, or you might want to be someone who wants to qualify things around qualitative research stories. And I can say from firsthand experience of working directly with ministers in the UK that they need both the quantifiable figures, but they do need the lived stories and the narratives. And the work in career development in the field of uh, stories, narratives, construction, constructivism, all of those issues really, really matter now and in the future. So what are the themes? Let me just very briefly um, highlight just a few for you. Let's start off with childhood and schooling. We know for sure that career related learning in primary school is a good thing to do. I want to give you an example and I want to make the case for why we need to do more of this now and in the future. I was involved in a study of 32 primary schools in seven of the most deprived wards in Derby City in the East Midlands. And the findings from that study, which is um, a sort of two year study interrupted by the pandemic, but continuing until July. Some of the findings actually remind us of why it's important for policymakers and indeed practitioners to really focus on this. And I know in Australia, Mary McMahon and in uh, South Africa, Mark Watson have been leading thinkers really in this area. And they have a new publication coming out uh, shortly from around the world examples of why this is important. But here's my making the case to you. Feedback from the children um, when they actually received a career related uh, learning intervention showed that innate key skills as illustrated here, um, you can see that actually it increased their skills development. And this was corroborated by their teachers. But the evidence also showed that children from different ethnic groups had a variation in response to the question. It was noted that white British children ranked themselves lowest in six of the eight skills compared to other five ethnic groupings. And of course, you will know perhaps already that um, from other international studies, that children often have a narrow view of the range of occupations available to them as illustrated here. But what I want to do is make the case around, if you have a look at the statistic of 97% of the children agreed with the statement that girls and boys can do any job. But despite this high level of agreement, the jobs identified by boys and girls showed that there's an unconscious bias in their preferences. Many of the boys highlighting football or some of those masculine type roles. Um, and many of the girls actually uh, looking at working uh, in hairdressing or maybe in a nail parlor. And that's just at the extreme end. But what it showed us in the study is that these children are influenced greatly by their parents and by uh, the world around them. And so in Derby, Rolls-Royce, a major employer, has had to significantly cut jobs. And many of the people who actually worked in those jobs are the parents of these children in these seven wards. 
So if ever there was a time that we do need to improve children's line of sight to work, particularly in families where perhaps there's worklessness or perhaps where they have been blighted by unemployment, these children, the hopes and dreams that they have, which are many, really, really need to be nurtured. And that takes me on to the next theme, which is teenage and adulthood, and making the case for investment in career education and indeed uh, in guidance. We know that when employers have the choice in most countries, they prefer to not take on young people, even if they're more educated than their older peers. And we know for sure, listening to many young people, that during the pandemic, there is this kind of confusion about which is the best pathway for them to take. So the OECD have been looking at this concept of career readiness and Dr. Anthony Mann is leading a research project over the next 12 months, looking at can we come up with some indicators on career uh, readiness. But I think the most important thing here is to uh, look at this uh, indicators at 15 of how young people, teenagers think about the future, exploring the future and experiencing the future. And when we look at beyond 15, we know that issues to do with teenage uncertainty, career ambition and career misalignment are really important issues. So let's give uh, some insight now to some of those themes that actually uh, come from this. So let's look here at teenage uncertainty and their thinking about the future. You can see here, just from this um, graph, that uh, when you look at comparing 2000 to 2018, Australia is here on the left uh, compared to the OECD average. But it's not just in Australia where there are concerns about teenage career uncertainty. A really powerful figure is that um, career uncertainty has risen by 81% across the OECD since the turn of the century. And so that combination of employers and the opportunity structure and teenage uncertainty means that we really have to build a bridge to help more young people to actually have those ambitions that they have realized. And here's another example where career conversations really matter. Again, if we look at the evidence base around high achievers and low achievers, the good news is that in Australia, you're doing much better than, let's say, in Italy or um, in some of the um, other countries like Estonia or, or Poland, etc., even Finland, which is often held up to be the exemplar in career development. But have a look more closely because the red lines indicate that these are the high achievers and the blue lines are the low achievers. And so this idea that people, young people in particular, need to speak to a person about their interests is really, really important. And we know really that looking at, uh, for example, PISA data shows that often teenagers from disadvantaged backgrounds have lower levels of ambition than their advantaged peers, even if they show through PISA tests that they have similar academic ability. So misalignment is really, really important. And we have to ask the question, well, how much is enough and which students need more and how do we go beyond managing outputs to enabling outcomes? How do we know if provision will work in difficult economic situations? And that's where your conference is really, really important because in Australia, you have your expertise and a conference or a summit like this actually uh, will bring lots of new ideas from your own lived experience beyond the work that the OECD is doing. Now, I think we have to recognize that sometimes it's good to be skeptical in terms of your starting position on all things. And I'm hoping that I'm convincing you in some way that investing in career development is really important, not just as a private good, but as a public good as well. And again, if we look at this study, uh, by the World Skills and the OECD just a couple of years ago, 
looking at 18 to 24 year olds who went to non fee paying schools. Australia is doing so much better than the UK. Once again, there's a trend here. The UK are in this lower quartile. But the question was asked, did, career guide, did you receive career guidance at school and did you find it useful? And in the short term uh, impact and the consequences, the evidence based gives us some powerful insights. So impact on career attitudes uh, makes a difference if you get a, a career's conversation and a, an intervention. Also, in terms of shifting your planning and pathway choice, we can see from the figures here. I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, but I want to just say that a study in England around personal guidance, which we call career guidance, showed that for every pound treasury invest, there's a 4.4 return on investment. So if you're interested in return on investment, feel reassured that the career sector is actually um, strengthening its body of knowledge in this regard. Now, with just a few minutes left um, to make the case, we cannot forget NEETS, vocational education training and higher education. And the big message is all about signalling that that balance between which of these vocational education training or higher education is most important. So there's a rich evidence base on the cost benefit returns of not being in education employment, not being left out of education, employment and training. So do seize that um, literature and make really good use of that evidence that you already have in Australia. But what's similar is in the UK, there's a worry that the balance will actually get skewed, where in a sense, vocational education and training is good, going to university is bad. And that's where we've got to make sure we get the balance right. From the University of Melbourne and New South Wales, I know that there have been higher education job cuts, but actually enrolments have increased by 37% in New South Wales. So that wicked question is where can you go for local career support that's trustworthy and impartial, both online and offline. So let's have a look. The curve ball I'm going to throw in, which I haven't got time to discuss in details, but you can get it from my slides later, is part-time work. Will we see an increase in part-time work, particularly for young people whilst uh, in schooling uh, in the future? So I think that's something for you as a summit to also sort of think about because part-time work research, longitudinal studies show that it can increase your earnings by the age of 30 and half as likely to be neat um, age 16 to 18. I know I had three jobs when I was a teenager whilst at school. Now adults, um, we really have to pay greater attention to adults it's too important to leave to chance. And again, there is a whole plethora of studies on employability and employability skills. But what happens in local communities and online is what really, really counts. Uh, and in Wales, they have a hashtag change your story national campaign where careers advisors trusted by government are diagnosing and assessing the most vulnerable and signposting them with training providers to the most relevant uh, provision. So something to, to think about in Australia, as well as Skills Development Scotland, looking at my world of work for adults to help them understand the labour market and how it's changing. Now, I mentioned earlier that women um, uh, are one of the, the groups, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, but just to say on a positive note that COVID-19 could reverse the limited progress that's been made on gender equality and women's rights going forward. But let's not forget that for those who are in particular uh, ethnic minority groupings, indigenous populations, that there is a, an unequivocal imbalance and fairness in the system around access to opportunities. And again, this slide does illustrate that. And it needs professionalism, it needs standards, and it needs support so that not just individuals who are trying to get into learning and work from these uh, minority groupings are supported, but that the workforce itself 
has got role models uh, at leadership and at every level that these um, individuals can actually look up to and aspire to know that whatever the barriers there may be, that there are opportunities for them to progress. So that's another big, big challenge around professional training. Now I want to finish, um, really, uh, just got two more slides. One is all about careers, mental health and well-being. And to really pose that question about greater alignment of services, we have to look at the evidence base, which shows that one-stop shop approaches or where we can have um, therapies that sit together actually can make such a difference around people's livelihoods, dignity and respect. And that requires working with public employment type services, employability services uh, in places and spaces digitally online and indeed in local communities offline. And so for the summit, the digital competence of practitioners is a major issue, as well as how can we help ensure that the clients that we serve have got the digital competencies to be able to access the most basic services. We know that in many areas, broadband is not good in rural communities, and we have to think about different ways of reaching in to rural communities and some of the ideas I've shared um, already. So finally, the big message is the bots are coming. Artificial intelligence and machine learning um, is on the ascendancy. I've been involved in looking at the use of chatbots uh, in careers. And that looking across the world, we can see that in many professions, artificial intelligence and machine learning now are seen as a solution. I believe in social technology. I believe that there will be a requirement for humans to work with bots skillfully in the future. So here are my final comments. Where do we go from here? For example, the potential need for additional support for those most at risk, the need to look at increased quality of delivery and standards, the need to find sustainable models of uh, guidance and support that can be delivered in different settings, the need to look at strategic sectors, closing skills gaps and labour market matching. The promise of approaches to quantifying gains in well-being, resilience and confidence alongside qualifying those issues of people's stories. And finally, more targeted research on returns on investment. So have a look at the right hand uh, side of my little seed that's growing in the corner here. The summit is all about planting seeds. So where are the gaps in your opinion? What ideas do you have for strengthening the weak areas? And what would be your priorities for further investigation? I've signposted a few useful reports here um, and you'll have my contact details if there's anything you want to look at further. But I want to really say the strong message of Australia has much to be proud of. Uh, not just in closing its borders early, but when it comes to scholarly and practice outputs. And so my message is harness this expertise, use it to really, really good effect. So I wish you well with the summit. Thank you. I'm with you in spirit. You have my contact details and best wishes for all of the important work that you do. Thank you. Until we meet again.